Dr. John Leong is the Vice President from SDR Engineering Consultant. He has over 20 years experience in bridge design. His presentation today is about a rehab design of a US 11 Pontchartrain bridge uh, using cathodic protection. Uh, good afternoon, this is John from SDR Engineering. In this presentation, I'm gonna introduce one of the projects we did, which is the rehabilitation of this US 11 Lake Pontchartrain Bridge. We're going to talk about what was the issue on this bridge and what was the invest investigation we did and what was the solution. First of all, let's take a look at the bridge. The bridge is located at the northeast of the New Orleans area, across the Lake Pontchartrain. It was built in 1928. That was the first bridge across the Lake Pontchartrain at that time. And on the side by side, we have this item twin bridges. And also on the, the east, we have this US-90. The interesting thing is during the Hurricane Katrina in 2000, 2005, uh, US-11 bridge, this old bridge, actually was the only one survived. All, all the other two bridges were damaged, and this bridge was the only pass you can travel from New Orleans to the, to the east. Sometimes you just, just got to respect those old engineers and the workers for the job they did like 100 years ago almost. At that time, there were no computer and no heavy equipment, but they can build bridges last 100 years ago and uh, surviving all the major, major disasters. So there got to be something we can learn from them. This shows the profile of the bridge. It has two steel movable spans and 700 concrete spans. And the total length is about 4.7 miles long. And at the time it was built in 1928, it was the longest concrete bridge at that time in the entire world. This shows the typical cross section. It has concrete deck supported by four concrete beams, then sitting on the top of this concrete bent with four concrete piles. This is a very typical bridge built in that, in that area, in that, that time. And this shows the profile of one span. And one unique thing about this bridge is that the girder is in the arch shape. The concrete beams in the arch shape. We don't do this anymore, but uh, theoretically, this is a better structure and also looks better, at least to me. This shows the bridge. And the front side, you can see that after this many years, 91 years, and the bridge is still good, and it's, it's beautiful. But the, even the bridge is still strong, and it starts to show many deteriorations. What I show here actually is a typical span. It's not the, the worst. You see this kind of a spore everywhere along the bridge. Here is a close view. You can see the spore is always up to the first layer of reinforcement and you can see the heavy corrosion on the reinforcement. It's very obvious that this corrosion is the cause of the spore because once the steel corrosion, it expands, just pop out the concrete. Here is another thing we noticed that just on the previous repair, you can see this dark color, that's the shock crate repaired before. Always uh, on the side of the previous repair, Pair, you always find this type of spots. It's very typical. And later we'll talk about why this happened and how to prevent this. Because if we just simply patch it, it will happen this, this will happen again, it will spoil. And another problem on the bridge is the, on the pile. This shows the pile, the typical cracks at the level of the water. Usually it's within three feet above the water and three feet below the water. This is another view, it's typical. I'll say probably more than 90% of the columns have this problem on the bridge. Another important test that we did also at the test is the, the chloride iron penetration test, test. We collect the samples at the 60 locations. Uh, we usually just drill at the bottom and drill every half inch up to the 2.5 inch. Because the steer is at a three inch, we don't want to damage the steer. So we drill that, and we send the sample, all the sample to the, to the lab. And we run the test and plug the, the, the diagram. You can see here, based on the collect result, I draw this 10 to 9 and find 
the chloride level at the location of syringe, which is the location of the steer, and the chloride level at that location is about 200, 250. That's about the level of chloride that the, con the steer will start to grow. So that was the problem on the bridge. The thing is that once we see that, we cannot just jump to the conclusion, hey, well, I'm going to repair like this, because every bridge is really unique. You can have the two exact same problems on two bridges, but the approach for repair are totally different. So the first thing we need to verify is really the structure. If this bridge is, if this issue is really a structure issue or it's just a durability issue. So we did the load rating on this bridge. And uh, we used the traditional analysis according to the actual code. We used the software called the bridge rating used to convert this. It's developed by Ashtoware. You can see here we have the load rating result for H193 inventory and the H193 operating. And I highlight all the load ratings with the value less than 1.0, uh, which means there is a deficiency. So you can see with the good, fair, poor condition, this structure, most of them actually, most of the time they have a deficiency if we follow the traditional analysis using the actual code. And they're all controlled by the moment at the middle span of the exterior beam. If you really look into it, there are a lot of things you cannot, it's not included in the analysis if you use a traditional analysis. First of all, the girders is in the arch shape. You cannot catch that effect if you use a beam element to the analysis. Second of all, it's the exterior girder. If you use the actual code, you use the, when you calculate the lab load distribution, you, they use the lever rule. We all know that the lever rule is very conservative. And the third thing is that this bridge, they have a big end diaphragm. And the end diaphragm is sitting on the top of the cap. It's all connected together. And that thing actually provide, will prevent the girder from rotation somehow. And the ca actually, theoretically, can create a like, negative moment at the end, such reduce the positive moment at the middle span. But if you do the traditional analysis, you cannot catch that effect. So what we did, uh, we, start with the, we, we built a finite element analysis. Actually, we used the most sophisticated method, which is build the, the entire thing, use solid element. We didn't use bin element and shear element, because you have to use solid element to, to catch all the effects. Here is the, the, the just show the model, how the model looks like. Um, we loaded this model with all different load cases, one truck loaded, two truck loaded, and move around all different kind of locations. But uh, this is not the topic of this presentation, so I'll just jump to the conclusion. You see the percentage over there, 72%. That's actually the moment we got from the 3D finite element over the moment we calculate based on the actual code. So with the evidence considered, actually the actual moment on this exterior beam is only 72% of what we predicted. But the, the thing about the final element is how are you going to prove this is correct? I mean, I, I built this model myself. I mean, it's best, based on the best of my knowledge and experience. I, I was very confident about that. Honestly, I don't know how to prove to other people this is correct. Because this is the nature of the finite element of analysis. It's a represent of the actual condition. Um, there's no way you can definitely compute exactly represent it. It's always close. So especially when we talk about this bridge with the 700 spans, so we got to be very careful. So then we discussed this issue with the LADOTD, and uh, we decided to do a load test since we have the equipment in house. So we went to the bridge and we installed the 16 strain gauges on the bridge, and uh, we brought two test truck again, play different locations on the bridge, and find what is the maximum moment on the exterior girder. Again, this is not the topic of this this presentation. I'll jump to the conclusion. This is just. Show the comparison of the micro strain measured by, by the strain gauges versus calculated from the finite element analysis. And we try to maximize the moment at the girder one, which is on the left. You can see he, over there, the finite element analysis and the load test are almost identical, they're close to each other. 
for the interior bin, the finite element analysis actually is conservative. Okay, since for this bridge, the extra bin control the load rating, so we can safely say that extra, they are they're close enough and um, the model is, is valid. So we use that model to do the, to the load rating. You can see here is the comparison of the load rating factor if you use the finite element analysis versus the traditional analysis used vertices. You can see here, after use of finite element analysis, pretty much all of the load rating factors are above one. I assume after repair, this bridge will be at least a fair condition, if not good. I mean, consider the year, year of construction that was 91 years ago. I wouldn't call this bridge good condition, but at least it will be a fair condition after repair. So you can see here, the load rating factors are all above one. So we are good. So the, pro the only thing we need to deal with is really the corrosion on the steer. So this is the repair plan we came up with. Uh, for the superstructure, we are going to do cathodic protection plus a CFRP wrapping. And for the substructure, we do cathodic protection and the power jacket. The cathodic, the cathodic protection is the method that we deal with the corrosion. But to understand how that works, first of all, to understand why, why there's corrosion in the bridge. So we all know that the concrete is a material with a very high pH level. The steel inside actually is well protected. It will generate a, like a very thin film on the outside. It's a protective film, actually protect the steel from corrosion. But what happens, once the chloride iron penetrate in there. It's that's happening in this bridge. Once you penetrate it there, it will break this protective film and it will cause a reaction called oxidation and the ferrous iron in there will lose two electrons. Okay, and these two electrons will travel to the surrounding area. Oh, by the way, since this area lose electrons, so this area will become an uh, anode. And the electrons will travel to the surrounding steel because they're all connected together. And uh, since this surrounding area receive the electrons, so this area will be a cathode, okay? So those electrons on the way will react with the oxygen O2 and also the water, H2O, and they will generate the material called hydroxides. So that's actually exactly the science explanation why we need oxygen and water for the, to, 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 to cause this uh, corrosion. Because we all know that it's a common, common, that's a common sense that you, corrosion, you need the oxygen and uh, water, and that's the exact explanation over there. And this um, hydroxide, will which is the, two, the, the OH minus, it will travel back to the anode. And here, through some reaction with the steel, it will generate this material, it's, it's a ferric oxide, oxides. And I put in the color brown, because this actually is a corrosion. All these procedures may be a little bit complicated, but um, if you can recall what, uh, what we learned in the science class in high school, by any chance, uh, this is not that easy, a lot, a lot that difficult to follow. Um, but uh, from an engineer view, all we need to keep in mind is that corrosion only starts when there's a chloride in there. Okay, once the chloride in there, the chloride contaminated area will become an anode. The surrounding area will be a, be a cathode. And the corrosion, it's always happen at the anode. And the, the, the cathode area actually, they are protected. That's exactly happened on this bridge. The first layer of reinforcement is always very there are a lot lots of corrosion on there. But the second layer of reinforcement, they're in good shape. Because the second layer, layer, level of the reinforcement is the cathode. It's protected. So, then what will happen if we patch it? So this uh, 
this brown, there's a brown color over there, that's the patched area. Okay, I assume we clean the clean the, the rust over there and the patched area. This area used to be an anode, but once we clean this area, the surrounding area will be an anode because that area has the that area have the chloride contaminated. So if we talk about potential, the, the concrete without any chloride, the potential is about negative 200. Uh, we call it negative because the electrons, electrons travel in the opposite way of the electric cover, current. So usually the lower, the lower potential is the, is the anode, and that's the where you lose electrons. Then the contaminated concrete, usually they have negative 350 MV. And the new patching area as well. It's because it's a new concrete, so it's still negative 200 MV. So what happened is this surrounding area will become an anode, and the corrosion will happen over there. That's what we call patch accelerated corrosion. Because you patch the area, actually, it's going to accelerate the corrosion in the surrounding area. And that's exactly what we observed on this bridge. So what is the solution? We cannot just simply patch it. If you patch it, it can actually accelerate the corrosion in the surrounding area. So we solve a problem, we create another problem. So the solution we came up with is this cathodic protection. Cathodic protection actually is very simple. You just introduce the uh, external anode. So over there, we usually this is a, is a metal, and um, the most common type is zinc. Use a zinc anode. You tie to the reinforcement. Since zinc with a very low potential, it's usually negative 1100 MV, so this zinc anode is going to be the anode, and uh, all the surrounding area will be a cathode and will be protected. Corrosion is still going to happen, but it's going to happen in this anode, okay, this zinc anode. So sometimes we call this anode as a sacrificial anode or called the galvanic anode. So that's the whole theory of uh, cathodic protection. Basically, you introduce an external anode, and that anode, it will close instead of the structure steer. This actually shows the anode installed on the side. That white thing on the, part, on the bottom, that's the, the galvanic anode. They come up with all different sizes. That's the size we decided to use on this bridge. Here is another picture and it shows the, the anode installed on the, on the cap. There are some certain rules you have to follow uh, when you do the install, installation. The first one is that you need to install the anodes at the edge of the spore. Many people thought that this anode is to protect the patched area, but that's not true. The patched area, once you clean the corrosion and uh, cast the new concrete over there, it's not going to corrode. With, like we talk about, this anode actually is pro protect the surrounding area. Okay, so that's why you need to put this anode as close as possible to the edge of the spore. Okay, then another important thing you need to confirm the electric continuity between the anodes and also the, and the reinforcement. You can just measure, it. and also the concrete, the patching concrete need to be some special concrete that with some suitable conductivities. Not only that, even the epoxy bonding agent, that's, that's the one you apply before you patch the concrete. That thing also need to have a good conductivity. Actually, for this, this bridge at the very beginning, when we reviewed the submittal from the contractor, they proposed the material actually was not electrical conduct, conductive. And uh, then, then we, we rejected it and we come up with a different material. I, I don't know you guys, but for me, this kind of things always scare me. Because you spend all the money to the investigate and time, you, you do the investigate and come up with the, the design and also choose the good material. But if you screw up in one tiny thing, the whole system is not going to work. 
and the, all the efforts you have done before is just a waste. Um, that, that's really the scare part, and um, unfortunately, as uh, we, we are engineers, so that's the thing that we, we deal with in our job. Okay, this is also the CFRP we provide, we designed after you applied the uh, galvanic anodes and the patch of the concrete. Then we put a CFRP on the top. Mainly it's for the confinement of that area. This shows the CFRP we installed on the side. That's before the paint. After we painted this, painted this, and you will even you will not even notice the the repair over there unless you get very close. This is the power jack that we designed for this bridge. The, again, remember that the crack is three in three feet above the water and three feet below the water. So the jack that we designed is eight feet. So basically four feet above the water and four feet below the water. And we have to break, you can see here, we have to break the concrete a little bit at the top and connect the galvanic anodes to the, to the steer, the main steer. Then after that, we just put a jacket, a power jacket on. This kind of thing can slap, just slap it together and then just pour concrete inside. This is one after you finish. I, I think it looks good for, to me. And also this can provide some extra protection on the, on the, on the piles. That's all I have for today. Uh, is there any question? Hi. Uh, good presentation. I was curious, when you say cathodic protection, it usually has to meet a criteria of at least 100 millivolt shift from the steel potential to the zinc potential. Yeah. Are you monitoring these systems to be able to determine that that's effectively being accomplished? And also with those embedded anodes, doesn't the concrete need to be able to breathe? That CFRP is going to be blocking that ionic current transfer, won't it? Uh, the, you, you're right. In order for this system to work, you have to have this electrical circuit. But that's the inside. You don't have to really that's inside the, between the galvanic anode and the, the, the concrete and the steel around the, uh, that area. And um, yes, also during the installation, you have to measure. Every time you install, the, you install galvanic anode there, there is equipment that you need to measure, make sure they're all connected together, and make sure the galvanic anode work, actually works before you patch the concrete. Because once you patch the concrete, there's nothing you can do about it. When you did the design for the galvanic anodes, yes. did you actually determine what's the size of the anode you need, and what's the current output of the anode, what's the distance you need between those? Because your CFRP effectiveness primarily you know, depends on concrete being sound. Yes. Otherwise, it's pretty, you know, it's not going to be useful. So that then decides how effective is your CP, right? Yeah. Um, that's a good question. Actually, there's uh, all the, the size of the command. It's actually depend on calculation. It depends on the amount of reinforcement there and also the level of corrosion. There's certain calculation you can follow and calculate what is required. And also depends on your expect life. What, how, how many years you want to protect it? For this project, what we did was uh, we, we tar target at 15 to 20 years of pr protection. So, and then according to that, we calculate the size and then put it over there. Yes. Actually, that you are protecting that steel and you are polarizing that steel. How can you measure that if you directly connect it to the steel? Now, that there's a. Uh, you basically, you measure the connection between the galvanic anode and the surrounding area. Make sure, because remember the galvanic anode is to protect the surrounding area. So make sure there is a close circle between the galvanic anode and the surrounding area, then you are good to go. Yeah, but how are you going to measure how much current the anode is putting out and polarizing the steel enough? They usually, they have equipment that you measure the, the resistance. Usually, I think it's uh, 0 0.1 ohm or 1 ohm, and it's uh, the measure. Okay, that's fine. Thank you all. Thank you. Uh, the preceding was produced by the National Center for Pavement Preservation. More information can be found on the web at pavementpreservation.org. 
Additional support provided by Michigan State University.